that route seems, at first glance, to be a short, rather unexciting book. It seems to lack the drama, which characterizes most other books in Tanakh. No one really engages in any sort of egregious sinfulness. There's no real lack of faith. There's no sensational murders or evil enemies or wars or problematic relationships. There's not even an appearance by any sort of representative by God, not a prophet, not an angel, to redeem this book from what seems to be its banality. There are some very nice people, and there are a few less nice people, but basically the book records life in Beit Lechem during the period of the judges, during the period of Sefer Shoftim, with a particular focus on the needs, the, the problem of one particular family. Now this lack of drama is particularly striking since maybe that route takes place during the period of Sefer Shoftim, which we know is really a very dramatic book. And I think the Chazal seem to relate to this question, framing it in the following manner. We have this in uh, Rut Rabbah, Perak Bet. The Midrash asks the question, Migilazu enba lo tum'ah velo tahara, lo isur velo heter, Ulema nichteva, right? This book, it doesn't have Tuma or Tara. It doesn't have prohibit, prohibited uh, um, laws, or it doesn't tell you all sorts of uh, uh, things that are permitted. And so why was it written? Now, Chazal do give an answer, and I'm going to get to their answer in Rut Rabbah in a moment. But first, I want to offer an idea, and that is that to understand the book of Rut, we have to look at the first pasuk of the book and the last pasuk of the book. The book opens with the words, Vahi bimei shvot hashoftim. And it was in the days of the judging of the judges. Now, as we noted, the days of the judging of the judges is a very dramatic period. It's also a very violent period. It's a very problematic period in biblical history. Um, but the book ends with the words, Vishai holid et David. The, the book ends with the birth of David and the promised beginnings of the monarchy. And the question that I think that I want to ask, and, and what I really think Miguel Root is trying to accomplish, is to take us from this period of the Shoftim to the period of kingship. And the question that I want to ask is, how do we go from the period of Shvot Shoftim, a period marked by uh, deterioration of leadership, a period marked by lack of chesed. The word chesed only appears twice in the entire book of Shoftim, once in the negative and once in a military context, not in terms of social interactions between people. Um, and by the end of the book of Shoftim, utter chaos reigns. There's no shofate. There's no leader, there's no king, there's no hope. Instead, society seems to be unraveling. There's a terrible civil war, and people seem to be behaving toward each other like the cities of Stom and Amora, which seems to suggest the imminence of total annihilation of Am Yisrael at the end of Sefer Shoftim. The last pasuk of Sefer Shoftim is, of course, by Amim Ahem, Ein Melech B'Yisrael, in those days, there was no king of Israel, and so everybody did whatever they wanted. In other words, utter chaos. The book of Shoftim ends with hopelessness, with the lack of the promise of kingship. But Ruth takes us from Shoftim to the period of kingship, to the birth of kingship, to the birth of David HaMelech. And the question is how? And the answer seems to be Ruth. Root is the Ima Shel Malchut. That's what Chazal call her. She is the mother of kingship. How does Root bring us towards kingship? How does Root extricate us from the quagmire, from the problematic period of Shoftim, and take us to a more promising period of good leadership and kingship? Well, I mentioned that the above Midrash asks the question, why was this book written? And the answer that it gives is, Lilom Decha, Kamas Khartov Legumle Chasadim, to teach you how great is the reward of those who do chesed, of those who do kindness. Now, it seems that the connection between this Midrash and what I said before is that what is the reward for kindness? The reward for kindness is kingship. In fact, the Midrash seems to be saying that the book is about how chesed produces kingship. How does chesed 
produce kingship. Of course, we know that the book is filled with chesed. Even though the book of Ruth is only four chapters long, the word chesed appears three times. And that's, of course, in contrast to the book of Shoftim, where I noted that the, book, that the word chesed only appears twice, once in the negative, once in a military context. The, 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 the word in the book of Ruth, chesed, is a very prominent word. It's very important for the book of Ruth. And so clearly, chesed functions in order to bring us from that terrible period of Shvot Shoftim to kingship. And yet, we have to note the sort of chesed that is performed by Ruth in the book of, uh, in the book of Ruth. Um, first of all, I think we note that the kind of chesed that is done both by Ruth and by Boaz is what we call chesed shel emet, true chesed. And that's because it is chesed that is done with the dead. This sort of chesed, namely, burying the dead, is done without any expectation of recompense, without any expectation that you will get anything back for that chesed. And so it's a particularly altruistic sort of chesed. And both Root and Boaz are described as doing this sort of chesed. But perhaps more peculiar and more even significant are the different acts of root of of root that that uh, that that describe her chesed and that describe the way in which she's acting throughout the book, and that is that root acts of chesed involve consistently self sacrifice, even to the point of self nullification. Each chapter has as at its core a story in which Root single-mindedly focuses all of her efforts on caring for Naomi and enabling Naomi to rebuild her ruined life, even at Root's own expense. We see that certainly in the first chapter when Root decides to remain with Naomi, with her mother-in-law, even though Naomi tells her quite explicitly, if you stay with me, you will have no future, you will have no husband, you will have no children, you will have no family or continuity. In the second chapter, we have Root volunteering to go and pick like a pauper in the field in order to obtain food for herself and for her mother-in-law. In the third chapter, Root agrees to risk her reputation and agrees to Naomi's plan that she goes down to the threshing floor in the middle of the night, dressed up and perfumed, presumably for the sake of ensuring the continuity of Naomi's family. Root doesn't seem to be very enthusiastic about this, and yet she does so for Naomi, stating, kol asher tomri elai e'ese. Everything you tell me, I will do. And perhaps the most significant moment of Ruth's self-sacrificial chesed comes at the very end of the book, when Ruth bears a child and unhesitatingly gives this child to Naomi, who places the child in her bosom so that the women say, Yulad ben le Naomi. A son has been born for Naomi. Root seems to sacrifice her maternal rights for the sake of her beloved mother-in-law. In fact, what seems to be rather peculiar is that all of Root's acts of chesed have one thing in common, and that is that Root repeatedly removes her own personal interests in undertaking her acts of kindness. Now, in order to make this point clear, I just want to point out an interesting uh, phenomenon that takes place in Paragimel of Megillat Rud, and that is that twice we have a kri velo khtiv. In other words, a word that is read when we read the Megillah, but actually not written in the scroll. It's not written in the cloth of the Megillah itself. And when you look at the scroll, you actually see a blank spot in place of the word. Now, both times that we have this phenomenon in Megillat Root, it is the same word, and it is a word that is spoken by Root herself. It is the word, a lie, to me. Root is speaking to Naomi, and she says to Naomi, kol asher tomri a lie e'ese. Everything you say to me, I will do. But the word a lie is erased from the cloth of the Megillah, from the actual written Megillah. 
A similar, identical, really, uh, thing happens in Pasuk Yud Zayin in Parak Gimel when Ruth is coming back from the threshing floor to tell Naomi what has taken place that night, what Boaz has promised her. And she says to Naomi, Ki amar elai al tavoi rekam el chamotech. He said to me, do not come empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Both of these times, the word a lie is erased from root sentence. And I think that this phenomenon is there to teach us root's characteristics. Root is the person who takes the a lie out of her sentence. She takes the notion of for me out of her motivations, out of her life, out of her acts of kindness, she is erasing the I in order to give to the other. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in the Megillah. Root does acts of kindness that are a pipeline for helping Naomi. When Root gets food, she brings it to Naomi. When Root receives a child, she passes that child on to Naomi. This is the selfless chesed of Root. In fact, in, when, in the above pasuk that I mentioned, when she is uh, citing Boaz, giving her the six stalks of barley, and she says to Naomi, Ki amar elai al tavoi rekam el chamotech, he said to me, do not come empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Many of the uh, commentaries note that, in fact, in the text itself, Boaz never says that to Ruth. It's possible, of course, that he said it to Ruth, and we don't hear it until Ruth cites him saying it. It is also possible that Ruth imagines Boaz saying it, because everything that Ruth receives, she hears in her mind, give this to your mother-in-law. That is how Ruth sees her, her acts of, 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 of kindness. Everything that she receives, she understands it as something which is meant to be passed on to Naomi. Now, what's striking, and what I really want to ask at this point is, it's striking that the Megillah presents this as a model, as a paradigm of kindness. Is this actually the, kind, the type of kindness that Judaism, that the Tanakh here is trying to promote, is the excessive nullification of self in deference to the needs of the other, the ideal definition of chesed? I don't think so. And I don't think it's what we see from other people who engage in acts of chesed in the Tanakh. I don't think it's what we see from Avraham. I don't think it's what we see from Rivka. I don't think it's what we see from many other acts of chesed in the Tanakh. And yet, the message of Migilat Root is very specific. The message of Migilat Root is that this is the type of kindness that is meant to lead to kingship. Kamas chartov the gomlei chasadim. How great is the reward of Root who does this type of self-nullifying kind of kindness. She is the perfect role model for the king, for leaders in general. It is this type of kindness that makes root the ima shel machut. And I'll, 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 I'll for a moment talk about the Tanakh's uh, approach to kingship or perhaps to leadership in general, and that is that the Tanakh is deeply ambivalent about kingship about human leadership in general. While it seems, of course, that leadership is necessary, and in the times of the Tanakh, particularly monarchy is necessary, monarchy comes with an abiding danger. Monar monarchical systems, uh, and all leadership, in fact, but certainly monarchy, concentrate power in the hands of one person. The king has all of the societal infrastructures at his disposal. The judicial system, the army, the treasury. Lord Acton fam famously said, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Indeed, we know this from the history of monarchies, from ancient to modern times. Monarchies can easily generate tyrannical, corrupt behavior. The king is inclined to enjoy his own powers and use them to promote his own self-interest. In order to find a formula for ensuring that the kings of Am Yisrael do not slide into tyranny 
as a result of their extraordinary power, the Tanakh presents an ingenious plan. Actually, several ingenious plans, right? We know from Devarim, Parakut Zion, the Tanakh puts all sorts of safeguards and checks on the king's power. He can't have too many women. He can't have too much uh, too, uh, gold and silver. Right? He shouldn't uh, uh, accrue too many horses. But at the same time, I think the Gilat root is providing us with another solution. The king is born into a situation in which he is meant to learn from the founder of his line how to be an outstanding, scrupulous leader who does not come to tyranny. It is this which I believe is what Migilat Ruth is really about. Migilat Ruth is the story of the Ima Shel Malchut. It is the story of the attempt to create a line of kingship that is designed to inhibit the potential for corruption through the development and the role modeling of particular personality traits. And this explains the particular kind of kindness which is exhibited by Root, by consistently undermining her own interests in order to give to the other. Root demonstrates that she is not the story, that she knows how to take the a lie out of her sentence. This is the absolute prerequisite for all of our leaders. We expect from our leaders that they will see the power that is concentrated in their hands, the power of the treasury, the judiciary, the army, not as something which is to be used for the promotion of their own self-interest, but rather as something which is meant to be used to help the other. The king should see himself as a pipeline for helping the other and should be able to erase his own needs in favor of the needs of the other. I want to conclude by <coughs> drawing your attention to a uh, particular, particularly interesting midrash where the midrash explains the etymology of the name Eli Melech, the husband of Naomi, who is from a Judean line. He's from the family of kingship, but he himself does not receive kingship. And the Midrash seems to be explaining this when the Midrash asks, Lama nikra shmo Eli Melech? Why was he called Eli Melech? Now we know the shot of that name means, my God is king. It's actually a very beautiful name, but the Midrash is very harsh with Eli Melech. And, 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 uh, and, and this is the way that the Midrash understands uh, Eli Melech's name. The Midrash says, Shem ha'ish Eli Melech, Shahaya Omer, Eli Tavo Hamalchud. To me shall come the kingship. In fact, Eli Melech is being presented here as the opposite of Root. Root is the ultimate mother of kingship because she knows how to take the Eli out of her personality, out of her sentences. Elimelech cannot become the king because he sees himself as the recipient of kingship and the Eli, the, the, the side of Elimelech that regards himself is very focused on, on, on himself, on his own needs. And that is a recipe for debauchery. That is a recipe for the con corruption of the monarchy. Root becomes the mother of kingship because she knows how to take the Eli out of the sentence. The purpose of Megidat Root is to lead us out of the quagmire of the period of the judges to kingship. This is accomplished by creating, by setting up role models who can teach us how to create a certain type of kingship, a kingship in which the leader takes himself out of the equation, sees himself as an empty vessel who is a pipeline for helping Am Yisrael, for using all of the power at his disposal in order to help the nation. And this ultimately is indicated by the name of the child who is born to Root and Boaz. That child is Oved, and that child is named by the people. The Oved is not simply an Oved Hashem, a servant of God, as the Ibn, Ibn Ezra says, but that child who is named by the people is also an Oved of the people. He is a servant of the people, born to create a lineage who seeks to lead, not in order 
to live in the lap of luxury, not in order to promote his own interests, but to lead in order to serve the needs of the people. I wish you all a Chag Sameach. Ke ishe khad, oi oi bilay bechad, vayichan sham Yisroel negeha.